you to take your Bibles again this morning and turn to the Old Testament, the book of Obadiah. As one preacher said when he was preaching from this, I'd read when he told the church to turn in their Bibles, he said, turn to the table of contents, because he understood that a lot of folks might have trouble finding the book of Obadiah. It's probably not one we've turned to a lot, but hopefully if you read through the Bible on a regular basis, you have read it several times. But the book of Obadiah, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, Please uh, take one underneath the chair, sit in, or close to you. We're going to, if you're able to, we'd ask you to stand with us right now in the reading of God's Word in honor of it. Obadiah chapter 1. Started preaching from here last Sunday and intended to preach one sermon on the whole book. And uh, now it's going to be at least two. We'll see how this morning goes if it ends up being three. But chapter 10, I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. Chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother, and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah, in the day of their ruin. Do not boast, in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people. In the day of their calamity, do not gloat over his disaster. In the day of his calamity, do not loot his wealth. In the day of his calamity, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of his distress. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For you, as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Verse 19, those of the Geb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sepharhad, shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Let's pray. As we've sang, Father, We are prone to wonder. We feel it and we do it. God, we ask for grace this morning so that in the rest of this day and in this coming week we would persevere better. That we wouldn't wander into the same sins of unbelief that we messed around with and gave into in the past week. We meet here each Sunday so that we could be conformed to the image of Christ as we worship our God together. We gather so we might scatter and proclaim the name of Christ more effectively and more intentionally. So, Father, as we look at your word written to the exiles of your people to encourage them that you see their plight and they need to wait and hold on and persevere. 
And Father, as the church exiled in the world, may we be encouraged this morning to keep on keeping on, waiting for the day of the Lord. your glory. And for those among us that are here that are not yet born again, I pray, Father, that they would see what the Edomites and the sins of Esau should have seen. That you bless Jacob and his descendants. That they must align themselves with the covenant that you make with your people and you've made a new covenant and the only way to know you and be right with you is through this new covenant ratified through the death of Jesus. So may they not rebel continuously as the Edomites but may they humble themselves and become true children of Abraham born again into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. Do this, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Again, to remind us of the context here, the, this book called Obadiah, if you'll notice in verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord concerning Edom. So you see that name, Edom. Edom is a nation. Edom was a nation that was composed of the descendants of Esau. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Abraham had been made a great promise that through Abraham he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And later, he had a son named Isaac. It wasn't Ishmael who would come to bless and it would be Isaac. And then Isaac, he would have twins. His wife would give birth to twins and in her womb were two boys that would be named Esau and Jacob. Esau would come out of the womb first. He had a reddish color, so he was called Esau. That means red. Later, his descendants were called Edom. That means red. He came out of the womb first. He was the oldest. Yet the scripture tells us that God, even before either one of the twin boys had done good or bad, that God had loved Jacob and had hated Esau. And that it was through Jacob that God would continue his promise. And so when the boys were born, there was a sibling rivalry. You can see that neither merited, just as none of us merit anything before God, right? Jacob was a deceiver. Esau was foolish with the blessings that God had given him, despising his birthright. And so as things pan out, there was this sibling rivalry between the two, and they reconciled later, but the descendants of Esau continued to feud. It was like the Hatfields and the McCoys, if you know, you've heard of that. They continued to feud with one another over the years. And then when the Israelites, who were forsaking God themselves, the chosen people, Jacob's descendants, were forsaking God, the kingdom, their kingdom split in two. They were more concerned about their kingdom than God's kingdom. They forgot about God's commandments. They gave lip service to God. And the remainder of the kingdom, the southern kingdom, went into captivity when a nation called Babylon came and ransacked the Mount Zion, that city Jerusalem. And guess who was watching with smiles on their faces as their brother Jacob, the Israelites, were being carried off by the Babylonians and Jerusalem was being destroyed. Guess who was watching? Standing by, it was the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. The Hatfields versus the McCoys. And they were watching and they were thinking to themselves, Tear it down! Tear it down! That's what it says in Psalm chapter 137. The Edomites were standing by. Go ahead, Babylon, do what you're going to do. They didn't raise a finger to lift their brothers. They failed to recognize that true blessing from God comes by humbling themselves 
according to God's plan as it was fulfilled through Jacob's descendants called the Israelites. Just as us today, if we're truly going to be children of God, we must humble ourselves, admit that we're sinners, and our only hope is through faith in Jesus Christ, who is descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We must be born again into that family. And so it's in that context that the prophet Obadiah prophesies. Because now the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, have been carried into Babylon. And there they are. And Obadiah is writing really directly to the Israelites in captivity to say, God sees what's happened. You deserve what's happened, but some of you are faithful. Sometimes you can be doing what's faithful. You can be trying to be faithful and still bad things are going to happen. Just like we're try- some of us are trying to be faithful in our country. Trying to be good Christians and still bad things can happen to our nation that affects all of us. And the same thing can be true in families or other contexts. So the message here was of Obadiah is really a message to the faithful among God's people that were in captivity. It was a message indirectly to the Edomites, a message of warning to them, just as it would be a message of warning to you who've not yet been born again and placed your trust in Christ. Or it would be a message of warning to those who would raise their fist and laugh when they see the church being persecuted. Because you see, the Edomites, as I mentioned last Sunday, were seated up in the rocks. That's literally where they lived. If you read the first part of the chapter in chapter 1, they felt like they were what, what had happened to Jerusalem couldn't happen to them. They actually had a physical place, a location in which in order to take over where the Edomites lived, you would have to go up to the cliffs and attack from below on the way up. Not a very good military tactic in the day. They didn't have stealth bombers to fly overhead and bomb the Edomites. You'd have to charge the hill. And so the Edomites felt impenetrable. The Israelites went into captivity because they were not concerned about God's kingdom anymore. They were playing around. But the Edomites were also just concerned about their own kingdom too. They didn't care about Jerusalem. They didn't care about God's kingdom. And the Lord tells us in chapter 1, the Edomites had a false sense of security. They were placing their security and their safety. They felt like they were going to be okay as they pursued their own kingdom. As I mentioned last Sunday, there was a game we used to play growing up called King of the Mountain. If you ever played it where somebody gets up and everybody charges up there and tries to tear them down from the top of the mountain and Somebody else gets up there, and then they try to tear that guy from the top of the mountain, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And and what we find out here is the Lord, he is king. He will be king, and his kingdom will stand. And the Israelites are to be encouraged by that because it says in verse 4 of chapter 1, to the Edomites, about the Edomites, though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. The Edomites are in this position in which they feel safe and secure. But the Lord says, others may try to bring you down and not be successful, but I will bring you down and you will never rise again. For it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. He goes on and tells us in verse 5 and 6, in your house and carry some stuff off, but they're not going to carry everything. He says, if I judge you, it's going to be utter destruction. I'm not going to leave anything. It's going to be worse than a thief breaking into your house. It's going to be utter devastation. And I would plead for you to listen very carefully right now. If you're truly not born again, if, you're not, if you've not humbled yourself and become part of God's kingdom through faith alone in Christ, that's what awaits you. And it's what you deserve. And it's what I deserve. But praise God that He's made a way Himself through His Son Jesus so that that just wrath was poured out upon Christ and for all those even any physical Edomite 
anybody who places their faith and trust in Christ will find themselves blessed among the faithful Israelites because there's one people that's called the church. So one of the lessons from last Sunday, without re-preaching all of that, was to seek the security of the Lord's kingdom. What are you placing that? The application from there was, what are you placing your security in? What do you, what, how do you spend your money? What, what are you thinking about all the time? What, what is it that you just can't wait to do when you first start your day? Are, are you, the message this morning, and it's just another take on where I left off last Sunday, is the title of the message is, Whose Kingdom Do You Seek? The Israelites got it wrong. That's why they went into captivity. The Edomites got it wrong. That's why they were going to be utterly judged by God the way it's prophesied here. Whose kingdom do you seek? How are you investing yourself in God's kingdom? And the message to the faithful among God's people, the Israelites that are in captivity, who are actual believers, trusting in God's promise, was that, look, look at the situation you're in. You're in Babylon. You're not in Jerusalem. You're not in, you're, you're, you're captives. They're trying, to, they're trying to brainwash Daniel and his Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story. And, but keep being faithful is the message to the faithful among God's people. It's the message to the faithful in the church. You, you're not investing yourself in the security in the world. You're investing yourself in things that other people say are foolish. Why waste your time? Why give your money? Why volunteer for things in the church? Why share the gospel? And the message to the faithful among God's people, it's not a waste. It's the exact opposite. You're wasting everything by not investing yourself in the Lord's kingdom. Because it's the kingdom, the last verse, it's the kingdom of the Lord's that shall stand. So the waste comes in by not seeing that. The message to the lost Edomite, the message to the lost person is repent. Trust in the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fulfillment of it, Jesus Christ, and the message to the faithful Israelite is keep trusting in him. Don't be downcast. You may not be able to sing one of the Lord's songs in the land of Zion like you want to, but there's coming a day when you'll sing like you've never sang before. Amen? So serve him. So when it comes to seeking the Lord's kingdom, I, I'll speak to you this morning about the two other aspects I mentioned last Sunday but never got to. Number two, then, is to seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. Seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. And I'll give you number three again and we'll see if we get that far. Seek to wait upon the coming of the Lord's kingdom. So number one was seek the security of the Lord's kingdom. Number two, seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. And number three, seek to wait upon the coming of the Lord's kingdom. Now, I don't care if you remember that outline or not. I hope it's helpful. But what I want you to remember is the message of Obadiah. The message of Obadiah is the Lord sees. The Lord's kingdom will stand. so much on my heart this morning if I could summarize it up in just a couple words I don't know maybe it's more than a couple but don't be in the middle don't be indifferent don't be apathetic quit playing around and it's not even meant to, to be in that tone necessarily this is actually a message to the faithful among us people is Hey, you're not playing around. You're serious. You're waiting upon God. So the, really the tone of this book here is you're not wasting your time. Keep doing it. He's coming. And if it's 
And if you are playing King of the Mountain this morning, let it be game over for you. Stop and recognize who's king. Just say right now, this morning, and, 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 I, and I say just say it. It's really going to have to be a work of God's sovereign grace, and I realize that, but it can be through the means of me pleading with you that that could happen. Is let it be right now in your heart this morning. Right now, I'm all in. I'm not playing around anymore. So seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. That's part of what that would mean then. To advance the Lord's kingdom. July 11th this week was the 30th, I think, the 30th, uh, yeah, 30th anniversary of the genocide that took place in Srebrenica in Bosnia. You hear me talk about Bosnia a lot. 30 years ago, in Bosnia and Srebrenica, uh, a little over, based on the estimates, 7,000 men and boys were, were murdered in a three-day period. And most of the world didn't know it was happening. And they were Muslims, and they were being killed by people that called themselves Christians. Orthodox Christians from Serbia, which adds another layer of why it's difficult to reach Bosnians. Because they can recall pictures of Serbians kissing crosses after they had murdered Bosnian Muslims. So this week was the anniversary of that. When I, when I walk in the streets of Sarajevo, and those of you who've been with me, you might recall, you'll, you'll still see bullet holes all over all the all buildings everywhere and so forth. And, but sometimes you'll come across graffiti that says, never forget. Sometimes you'll see something that says, never forget forgive but often you'll see never forget never forget what happened to Srebrenica or never forget what happened to Sarajevo a city under siege for three years where similar to things like you're seeing in Ukraine and so forth and other places happening never forget you see when the war took place in Bosnia just to help you understand it was neighbor against neighbor. People had lived together for years and years and years. Serbians, Orthodox Christians, Catholics from Croatia that lived in Bosnia, in the predominantly Muslim country, and then Bosniaks side by side, next door. And then suddenly, as the former Yugoslavia broke up and the nations began to declare their independence, literally, neighbor turned against neighbor. And brother sometimes turns against brother because sometimes they had different ethnic backgrounds within their own family. That kind of long-standing tension still exists in, in Bosnia. So what I want to give you a picture of is that's the kind of long-standing tension that continued to exist between Esau and Jacob, the descendants of one another. And these ethnic tensions had grown into a full-blown ap apathy among the Edomites, as I described a while ago, as they saw the descendants of Jacob going into captivity. What's the Bible say here? What, what's the Bible say they did? Look at verse 10. You looking at your Bible? Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. You see that? They watched their brother, their kinsman. This happened and did nothing. Shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Now what is it that they did? It says because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. Well, it was actually a different nation. It was the Babylonians in this context that were attacking Israel. The Edomites weren't doing that. You could recall a quote that somebody made. I don't know if it's attributed to different people, but the only thing necessary to triumph, for evil to triumph, is for a good man to do nothing. And that's basically what was true here. The Edomites may have participated in some direct way but it was basically the fact that they didn't lift a finger to help their brother. Look at verse 11. On the day you stood aloof. You see that? On the day you stood aloof. You stood opposite. That's literally what that word in Hebrew means. They stood opposite and they watched as Jacob, Israel, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, were being attacked. They stood. And it says, as a result, look at the end of verse 11 says you were like one of them you stood aloof 
And even though you didn't directly participate, it was, the Lord says, it's as if you did. You were like one of them. You were like one of the Babylonians because you stood aloof and didn't do anything. So you're guilty. Verse 12 says, but do not gloat over the day of your brother. So what we see, just moving on here, is there's a warning to the Edomites that gives a message to the faithful among God's people. There's a warning here. Notice it says, do not. Verse 12. You see that? Now I want you to look at verse 12 through verse 14. You're looking at your Bible? And notice how many times you see the phrase, do not. Count them. You looking at your Bible? How many times? Somebody tell me. Eight times. Eight times. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. I don't know if I got the eight yet or not. But do not eight times. That's the warning. They had done it. And so the message is, don't do it anymore. Don't. Do not. Do not participate indirectly. As in verse 12, do not gloat. Some were just, they were just gloating. Enjoying it. It says it again in verse 13, do not gloat. It says again in verse 13, or excuse me, verse 12, do not rejoice. Look at verse 13 again. It says, do not boast. So there's this, this indirect participation that they were guilty of, whereas the Lord says you were just like one of them. You gloated, you rejoiced, and you boasted. But then there was somewhat of a direct, more direct participation, perhaps, where they're told in verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people. End of verse 13, do not loot his wealth. Verse 14, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives or hand over, do not hand over his survivors. You see, folks, it was just not that what the Edomites did, it was what they did not do. What should the Edomites have done? Because you see, the message here is if we're seeking the Lord's kingdom, what should we do? Seek security in the Lord's kingdom. And then number two, what I've said in the outline here is to seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. As believers, we're not to be just standing aloof. Well, I'm not doing anything bad. I'm not doing what the world does. But people are going to hell and you're just standing here watching it happen. Or babies are being killed in their mother's womb and we're just standing here watching it happen. We're not to stand aloof. They were being rebuked here, not just because they didn't directly participate in the evil done to God's people, but they just didn't do anything to stop it. So it seems to me that an application would have been to the Edomites and, and should be for God's people, the church, seek to actually advance the Lord's kingdom. That the Edomites should have sought to advance the kingdom of Israel. They should align themselves with the sins of Jacob first off. And when the Babylonians came along, they should have stood with the Israelites and said, this is not right. Or even fought alongside the Israelites to keep it from happening. But they would not do it. So that's why the message of application for us is seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. If we're, whose kingdom do you seek? If you seek the Lord's kingdom, seek to advance it. George Bush said in September of George W. Bush, September 20th, 2001, shortly after the September 11th attacks, he had said uh, in a speech, interview, whatever, on the news, he said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. He said that to anybody in our country and anybody in the world. You're either with us, you're going to support us, you're going to say we're doing the right thing, you're going to help us, or you're with the terrorists. That's similar to the message that I'm seeking to help us understand. It's what Jesus said. Look what, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 28. There, the religious leaders of the day were saying, He cast out demons by Beelzebub. And Jesus says, A kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. So in Matthew chapter 28, chapter 12, verse 30, where he's trying to help them understand that the, the kingdom of the Lord is at hand. He says in Matthew 12, verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. 
This is what Jesus said. It's not enough to say, I'm with Jesus. But Jesus says, whoever does not gather with me scatters. There's actually, what, what? I'm seeking to help us understand is that there must be an intentionality in how we live our lives as Christians to advance the kingdom of God. And I'm so thankful to be part of a church family where I see that in so many of your lives. And I'm blessed by that. And I hear about some of you invite people to church and how you're burdened for people you work with. You're sharing the gospel. You're seeking to advance the, the Lord's kingdom. Or you're volunteering, taking time off work to go to church camp with a bunch of teenagers all week or whatever it is. Help them a vacation Bible school or trying to embrace where you work, live, and play as your mission field in, in unique ways. Brothers and sisters, the message to the faithful among God's people in the book of Obadiah is keep doing that. You're doing a good thing. Keep seeking to advance the Lord's kingdom, even if it doesn't seem like you're seeing a lot of fruit or if you're being persecuted for it or being given a hard time. Seek to advance the Lord's kingdom. It's not a waste. It's not in vain. One of the, as a Southern Baptist church, we support missionaries around the world. And uh, Allie McCarty is somebody that was highlighted this week and it was on our Facebook page this morning. Allie McCarty, you don't know her, I don't know her. Um, she went on a mission trip. And uh, I don't know if I would have allowed somebody that's not a Christian to go on a mission trip, but she went and she was not a Christian, but she was born again while she was on a mission trip. She said on that mission trip she saw true Christians, authentic Christians in action, and the Lord used that to bring her to Christ. Then later, when she came back, she understood that two billion people in the world live without access to the gospel. And she said, how can I stay here? and not go. So for her, intentionality looked like, I've got to go to the international mission field. And so today, she is in Hungary, learning the language, and trying to reach students by using her business skills on a campus, in a campus setting, living out the gospel, trying to minister to Ukrainian refugees there. And she's there because many of you give and churches like ours give because you understand this is one way I can help advance the kingdom is help people that can go that have been called to that. Last week we had a parade outreach here in town and we didn't have we had a lot of hot dogs left over, but we had did we did have people come and get a hot dog. And while you were past some of you were passing out hot dogs and so forth, some of us got a chance to interact with some people in our community. I talked with a family that was standing here against this wall over here. I went up to them and talked to them, and I had these million-dollar bill gospel tracts. And passed one out and talked to them a little bit and asked them where they went to church. They weren't even from around here. They were from somewhere in Kentucky. And, and, uh, and I started sharing the gospel with them in a, in a way that didn't embarrass the father in front of his children. His father would have found out was from a Catholic background. Well, I'm sorry that not sorry, I am sorry to say the Roman Catholic Church doesn't preach the gospel right. I believe you're saved by works. That's what it comes down to. And I explained to them otherwise in so many words. If we weren't intentional to do the kind of things that we do, that opportunity wouldn't have happened. And to me, success is being intentional, seeking to share the gospel and leaving the results to the Lord. I believe that's how the Lord defines the results. So, Thirdly, we need to seek to wait upon the coming of the Lord's kingdom. Never forget, that's a message here beginning with verse 15 that we need to remember, is that the Lord sees. He's not forgotten us in our plight. He's not forgotten us. Obadiah, as one pastor said, reassures us that God never relegates unresolved injustices to a shelf of cold cases. He never forgets. He sees the injustices in the world done to you. He also sees the ones done by you. But if you seek the Lord's forgiveness, 
The Bible says he remembers your sin no more. Amen. But for those who don't repent, who will not come to repentance, there's coming a day of restitution. Now I want you to notice in verse 15 what the Bible says. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. If you understand what the day of the Lord means, if you're an unbeliever, you, you shall be shaking in your boots. Because that's the day when the Lord comes like a thief in the night and he's not going to leave anything left over. That there's going to be utter destruction and judgment coming upon the nations. The book of Joel tells us that multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It's not as if they're, they're in this valley waiting to make a decision for the Lord. They've made a decision. There's a decision in their heart to rebel and turn away from God, and they will not repent, and the day of the Lord is coming when he will pour judgment about the, upon those who are in that valley of decision. Multitudes. I was in my office this week. You ever had a fly just bugging, literally, no pun intended, bugging you to death? And I was in my office, and there was a fly buzzing around, around and around. And finally, I thought, I'm going to do something about this. And I found my fly swatter, and, you know, and I laid it, and the, and the fly quit buzzing around. I was like, <laughs> I become convinced that the fly was demon-possessed. I took that fly swatter, and I laid it over my lap like a double-barrel shotgun, just waiting for the opportunity and it, it land on my coffee cup and I said I can't get it on my coffee cup but finally it gave me an opportunity and I smashed it and where I smashed it was right on last Sunday's sermon outline and it lay dead right by the words the kingdom of the Lord shall stand you demon possessed fly The reality is, is that for those who truly do rebel against God and bug God's people to death, sometimes literally, and persecute the people of God and will not repent, there's coming a day when they will see their kingdom will not last. The kingdom of the Lord will stand. And for believers, brothers and sisters, that we're actually to rejoice in that. We're not rejoicing that people are going to go to hell. Please don't understand. But we're rejoicing that there will be coming a day of vindication. Do you want to be vindicated? Do we have this sense of a desire to be vindicated that we were right after all? Or that we see justice and so forth? Well, we do. But we're not called to seek that. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We're not to get wrapped up in seeking justice as an end in itself. I'm not saying we're not to be concerned about it in the world. We're to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and realize that true justice and true vindication will not happen until the Lord comes and he swats the enemies of God once for all. They will not rise again. That flies in the trash can. It ain't coming out. Notice what it says in verse 15, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. That's what happened to that fly, literally on its head. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Verse 16, for as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow. They shall be as those they had never been. The drinking here he's talking about is like drinking the wrath of God. You've poured out your wrath on God's people, nations, not just eat them. Notice he says... As you have drunk, verse 16, look at your Bible. As you've drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. He's saying, he's saying to God's people, it's not just the Edomites, church. Really, he's talking to the church of God ultimately here because we're with the fulfillment of this prophecy, folks. He's talking to God's people. He's saying, God's people, it's not just the Edomites, your enemies, that God's going to execute judgment on that you're waiting for. But he's going to execute, ju execute judgment on all the nations on all those that oppose God's people. And they're to rejoice in that. And they're supposed to live out in light of this truth, knowing that they don't have to labor for vindication. They need to be wrapped up in seeking to advance God's kingdom and wait for God to do what God has promised to do. 
There will not be any acceptance for any nation according to verse 16. What goes around comes around according to verse 15. As you've done, so it will be done to you. Maybe some here need to be reminded of that and even warned from it. If any of you ate in it, one person, pastor asked, have any of you eaten at any Edomite restaurants lately? I don't know of any. The Edomites were thoroughly judged by God. Verse 18 says, the house of Jacob, the Israelites, shall be fire, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and they shall be no survivor for the house of Esau. This is what the Lord has done. So he will do to all those who oppose his people and persecute his people. What we need to be reminded, folks, is the Lord is not standing aloof when he sees his people suffer. You may think that. That's why we we're given the Psalms to pray. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus prayed. Do you feel that way sometimes? That the Lord's aloof? He's just standing watching, not doing anything. But in fact, everything that's happening in your life, the Lord is doing to make you more like Christ, to sanctify you. It is for your good and for his glory. And I know there's much mystery in that. But the reason I can rest there is because he planned the hardest thing for me. He planned the death of his son Jesus on the cross. So I trust him for everything else. He's not standing aloof. He sees what's happening in the world. He sees what's happening in your commu this community, in your life. Remember when Saul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus? Remember what Jesus said? Saul, Saul! Remember the question? Why are you persecuting the church? Did he say that? Jesus was in heaven. He said, why are you persecuting me? Saul, if you mess with my people, the church, you're messing with my body. You're messing with me. Jesus was not standing aloof. And in the, in the book of Revelation, what you see are seven golden lampstands representing the church in Asia Minor. And then there's the scene of someone sitting in the middle of those candlesticks, and it's Jesus. And the message is, persecuted church, Jesus is right there with you. He's not aloof. All hell's not breaking loose. That same Jesus is right there with you. In Revelation 4 and 5, he's the one that opens up the book and is worthy to break its seals. He controls human history. All hell's not breaking loose. Our Lord is in control, and he's coming. That's the message. He sees, and he's acting. And he's supposed to encourage and exhort us as we see things unfolding around us that we're not happy about. So there's coming a day of restitution and brothers and sisters, as I'll preach more about next Sunday, but I do want to speak just a little bit about right now. There's coming a day of restoration. In other words, they're going to get what's coming. We don't rejoice in anybody's judgment. Well, I've got to say that again or you'll hear that wrongly. But for those that will not come to repentance, the psalmist prayed that way, Lord, wipe them out. And the way I think we pray those type of psalms, those imprecatory psalms, is, Lord, if, they will not, if you will not bring them to repentance, then, Lord, remove them from the face of the earth. That, that's the imprecatory psalms. And I think that's how we approach when we hear what we hear here in the book of Obadiah. If they will not be brought to repentance, then we rejoice that one day you will humble them and they will not rise and persecute your people again, and we rejoice in that. You will have the last word. Amen? He will have the last word. There's coming a day of restoration. Verse 17 says, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape. What did it say about the survivors of Esau? No survivors. House of Jacob, there will be those who escape. Not everyone. Just because you're a physical descendant of Jacob, an Israelite, Jewish blood flowing through your veins, doesn't mean you're going to escape God's judgment because we're all under God's judgment, according to Romans chapter 3. None seek God. No one's righteous. No, not one. But in fact, those who escape 
in light of the coming of Jesus Christ are all those, whether they're, they got Gentile blood or Edomite blood for that matter, or Israelite blood going through their veins, all those who escape judgment will be those who've placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who satisfied God's judgment and wrath on the cross. And for those, there's coming this day of restoration. As it says here in verse 17. Look at the end of verse 17. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. They'll be restored. He will make, as Revelation says, all things what? New. That day's coming for God's people. That's the day we wait for. That's the day we pray for. And that's the day that we long for. This day day of restoration let's pray our father thank you that in this book that called Obadiah that is the very word of God. That it's not just the very word of God to exiles in Babylon, but it's the very word of God to the church, exiles in the world, elect exiles, though, chosen by grace. Apart from anything we've done good or bad, Thank you for what Christ has done to satisfy the judgment that we deserve. And Father, as we think, about, we think about the nations, we think about people in our community, maybe sometimes people we know personally or groups of people that politically aligned in certain ways that are completely opposed to everything we stand for. Lord, we pray, first of all, that you would be glorified in their salvation that you would bring them to repentance. Lord, that as we advocate, as we think about voting and all these sort of things, that we would do so and we would try to be wise in doing so. But Lord, we would also know that the gospel is the power of God, that we would be consumed with seeking to make disciples and loving our enemies as we proclaim the gospel to them. And Lord, since our knowledge is limited about what you will do, we don't know who you will save and who you won't. Lord, we, we want to go to all and we pray you'd lead us. And Lord, we also thank you that for those who will not be brought to repentance, Lord, that there will come a day when your people, your church, will not suffer anymore. That your promises will be completed. That restitution will take place and restoration will take place to your people. that all the promises of God find their yes in Christ and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord and we will see we will see for those of us who are faithful who are laboring to be faithful dads and moms and co-workers and it's often very difficult Lord that we will see that it was not a waste that our labor in the Lord was not in vain so strengthen and encourage our faith today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So let's stand together this morning and let's praise our God for His truth as we sing this hymn. I believe we're singing All I Have is Christ. Let's praise our Lord together. <laughs>